at this time, I am going to go ahead and call to order our meeting. Uh, we do have a quorum of uh, five uh, trustees. And at this time, uh, would you all like to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, next on our agenda, 1.3 is public comments, and uh, we uh, do not have anyone uh, here to join us for public comments, so I'm now going to move ahead to 1.4. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes from May 28, 2020? I also move. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Uh, moving on then to 1.5, correspondence uh, announcements and common council reports. I am going to look over to our library director, Garrett Erickson, to see if there's anything that needs to be shared. Um, nothing at this time. Uh, next, uh, moving on then to committee reports, uh, 2.1 Finance Committee, and I will turn this over to Kyle Welton, who is the chair for a report of the June 22nd meeting. And I think, Kyle, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Working mistake. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Finance Committee convened uh, earlier this week and we reviewed the financials and accounts payable so far. There's nothing that's uh, out of order there. We're still waiting for some uh, revenue to be recognized properly from the city's finance department. So it's slowing the, the budget process a bit, but we're, we're on target there. Um, and we'll talk about this later in the agenda, but the committee has recommended that we um, remove late fees or defines for patrons under the age of 18. Um, and also that we alter our gift policy to move those funds uh, to the foundation. So is there any, uh, any questions for myself or for Debbie on the, 20, uh, the June 2020 financials? And it, uh, for those of you who are looking at the agenda later under um, number three for discussion and possible action, we do have the uh, information regards, regarding moving the, the Mead Fund to the foundation. So I think at this time um, we are looking for a um, motion for the uh, uh, Payment of the expenditures, Kyle? Yep. So uh, I was just still waiting to see if there's any questions. If there's none, I'll, I'll move that we okay. approve the uh, accounts payable for June 2020. Well, in looking at, whoop, I was going to say, in looking at the screen of everyone's uh, wonderful faces, it does not look like anyone's waving to have a question. <laughs> so I can at least share that with you, Kyle. I can't, I can't see folks in the uh, council chamber, sorry. Um, yeah. We'll go ahead and uh, I, I've moved and uh, Mary Lynn, did you second? I did. And any further discussion points for Kyle? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Anything else for the Finance Committee uh, report, Kyle? Uh, I, have, I have nothing to share with that. I yield. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Moving on now to 2.3, the Human Resources Committee. Uh, Kathy Norman is the chair, and I'm hopefully going to push the right button so that she can speak. No. All right. You can hear me? 
All right, we met just last week, and the main um, point of the meeting was to discuss a change to the table of organization, which we have on the agenda to discuss at a later date. So we might just wait till we get down further on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, yeah, so the, the committee was basically uh, considering a, a TO change, and so we'll bring that recommendation forward in a bit. Okay. Uh, so I guess uh, uh, then we can uh, move right along then to uh, section number three, items for discussion and possible action. Uh, the first one is 3.1, uh, discussion of late fines for youth. And I am going to turn this over first to our library director, Garrett Erickson. And I forgot to turn them on, see? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so you should have two attachments in uh, on this particular agenda item. One is um, what we've charged and what we've received for money. And uh, the uh, we did have quite a discussion at the, f at the uh, financial committee talking about this. Um, it was decided to go ahead and recommend to this group that we would pass this. But the thought is here, uh, we have uh, collected last year in 2019 about a little over $7,000. Um, the thought would be that we would uh, stop charging youth to um, use the materials. If, they're, if they come in late, we wouldn't charge them a late fee. Obviously, that doesn't uh, count if they were to lose the materials. It'd still be charged for lost materials. Um, but the, the late fees would go away. And so the thought would be there that we would uh, hopefully get a lot more people um, using the materials if they weren't afraid of the, the late fines accumulating. So um, one thing that we missed in the, uh, meet, the committee meeting was um, talking about whether we would go back and uh, retroactive, retroactively uh, wipe out those fines for, that, for the youth as well. So perhaps we could talk about that as well. Uh, this is uh, Maeve and uh, just uh, some thoughts that were uh, shared at the Finance Committee uh, was the fact that um, this policy that we have at Mead actually ends up sort of conflicting with our mission and our vision of our library. And uh, uh, we, as, as a board, we really try to have policies in place that helps our uh, professional staff to achieve the mission and vision. And by having this type of fee policy has resulted in uh, quite a few of our families in our community uh, not utilizing the resources of our library. And in light of uh, the continuing challenge of COVID-19 pandemic, we recognize that families are going to need the support of their library more than ever. And by uh, making a change to the late fee um, policy and uh, discontinu discontinuing the fee for youth um, will in fact help us uh, achieve our mission even more. Um, is there anyone else who would like to um, chime in and or have any questions about this new uh, change? This is something that we talked about quite a bit uh, before COVID-19 pandemic uh, sort of uh, uh, turned our focus elsewhere. So we're kind of revisiting something that we've had some good discussions about in the past. So it uh, looks, like, uh, looks like Meg would like to uh, uh, chime in. Meg Albrink. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify, are we, is the policy that's under discussion applying to any youth materials that are checked out, or is it applying to any materials checked out by a youth card holder, or does it even matter? Meg, um, that's uh, customizable, and our thought, I believe, would be to make it for patrons um, under 18, as well as the materials would be considered a youth material. Great. I just had seen the, the materials, the documents provided focused on the materials, but it sounded like we were talking about cardholders, so I just wanted to have a mm -hmm. clear understanding of what we were voting on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, Kathy Norman, I believe you had, yeah. uh, let me see if I pushed a button. Right. Does it look like it's well, working? Should I see myself or just hear myself? Can, you myself. want to try pushing the button? Oh, there you go. Yeah, so we had also talked well, it, about... Just one, just one oh. moment. I don't think it's working. So, Oh. oh. I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. He's coming. So, um, We had talked about... Um, oh, there you go. Thank you. 
about also getting rid of late fees altogether um, at one point, just because some libraries are doing it and, and it sort of seems to be a trend nationwide. So I'm not remembering how we got back to the point where it's just youth services. I get that it makes sense because we can hold them, they shouldn't be held to the same sense of responsibility as adults, but are we going far enough? That's an excellent question. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Garrett Erickson. Um, really, it's a financial question at this point. I mean, we'd like, I think the aspiration is to get rid of fines, uh, late fees altogether, but we also have to consider how much uh, that would be. I believe that was, uh, we were collecting about 30000 a year was in the budget, and so we'd have to make that up somewhere else. Okay. But the, the timing of that question is excellent, Kathy, mm -hmm. because we're in the process of putting together together our budget for the city for 2021 and maybe that's something be something that we uh, include within our budget that we would uh, like to be able to have the funds in order not to have this policy that conflicts with our mission. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, Mary Lynn Donahue. Um, I think Kathy's question is a good one. Um, I think starting with these materials and use card holders is a really good place to start. And I think it will help us figure out, um, I truly don't think this will happen, but you know, whether for, for some reason material use is being abused or whatever. Um, so I think it's a good place to start. And I think we frame it not only in terms of COVID issues, but in terms of class and race issues, um, that lower income kids and their families um, uh, for them, the library is a, well, for all of us, but um, it is an amazing and important resource. And to take down any barriers to participation, I think from that perspective is real important as well. Um, I think we could clearly come back. I mean, I'm gonna assume, you know, in a few months we'll have a good sense of, you know, we've been got increased usage and, you know, just whatever metrics we decide we want to measure. And then we can go on uh, and look at um, uh, adult uh, fines and fees as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And I also think that, um, so this is going to be um, the upcoming budget year. I mean, we're just right in the thick of it now to 2021. It's going to be extremely challenging. And um, so, I think handling $7,000 is in a budget this large is not a problem. I think 30,000 is not that large either, but um, I just, it's a good place to start. It, and it'll set fewer heads of hair on fire. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, who would like to either ask a question or share a comment? Okay, doesn't look like anyone. So uh, at this time, we would like uh, to have someone uh, to move approval of eliminating the late fees for patrons under the age of 18 and retroactively cancel their accrued uh, fines up to this point. Maybe this is Kyle, I so move. And is there a second? Okay, uh, moved and seconded. Any further uh, discussion? Uh, at this time, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And, aye. Um, any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, special thanks to uh, the library staff that uh, really explored and researched this issue and brought it forward for us to consider. I, I think it's uh, very well time that we're taking this step to be more inclusive and uh, be a better service for all of the families in our community. So thank you. Uh, now we get to move on to item number 3.2, uh, the Mead Public Library Fund. And again, I'm gonna turn this over to our library director, Garrett Erickson. Thanks, Maeve. Um, we had, again, discussed this at the Finance Committee at length. Um, I'll try to give the abridged version since four of you were in that meeting. Um, really, this, there, there's about $1.4 million that um, is in this fund that we're talking about. 
And much of this was donations that started in 1969 and then accumulated over time from other donations up until the library's foundation was created in 1989 with the focus of managing funds of the library and, and sort of supplementing the library's budget. Um, so this money accumulated and, and uh, it's still sort of sitting there as an orphan. We don't, we, we do use it of course, um, but it, um, we don't have all the vehicle, uh, basically we had to give it to the foundation for investment purposes anyway. It was a fund that was in the, um, under the management of the city and, and what was called the SWIB, uh, State Wisconsin Investment Board. It wasn't making a lot of money and in 2014, the trustees at that time chose to move it over to the foundation for investment. Um, however, they maintain control. What we are talking about today is finishing that uh, sort of compromise that we made in that in 2014 and moving it completely over to the foundation for their uh, keeping they can control it that way and, and work with it. So um, in, in by statute, statute 43.58, the library board does have the ability to um, make this uh, gift to the foundation. So I guess I'll kind of open it up for questions or if any of the other uh, board members that were at that committee meeting had the uh, things that I might have missed. Okay, if anyone has a question or a comment, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mary Lynn Donahue at this time. No, uh, maybe I forgot to ask this at the, at the finance meeting. Um, have we discussed this with the foundation and uh, is it willing to take the money? Do you want to? I, I didn't hear what you said. Can, can you say that again, Mary Lynn, that we're trying to understand? Okay, can you, can you understand me now? Yes. yes. Okay. Hello? Yes, mm -hmm. yep, good. We can hear you now. Well, Got it? Uh, well. Okay. <laughs> My question, Maeve, was uh, whether or not um, the foundation board has uh, uh, looked at this and, and is willing to take the money. Um, several of the foundation's officers know about it. They haven't taken a formal vote. The thought was once uh, the library board made this motion that then they we would convene. Normally we don't meet in the summer, but we would con convene the emergency group, the, the officers, and accept the gift if that's what happens. So, but they are aware and the, the finance chair uh, is aware of it. Mm -hmm. I just, um, I think this is a really excellent idea. Um, having these funds strewn over various places just isn't, it's, from a fiduciary point of view, I, I think it's hard to keep the management of the funds under enough control. So I think this is really a smart idea and I think we should absolutely do it. Uh, thank you. Uh, turning this over now to Kathy Norman. And okay, so just speaking from a historical perspective, Maeve gave a, gave a great history background, but I just wanted to add that when we first brought this money over from the library's 850 fund to the foundation just to invest, it was because we were getting absolutely no, making absolutely nothing off it, like a fraction of a percent. Um, but the compromise, the, the library board was a little concerned at that time, or at least some former board members, that they'd lose control of how it got used. So they wanted to sort of keep it within the library board. Well, I think a level of trust has been established since that time between the foundation board and the regular library board that we're all in this together. We all want to spend it on the same things. We all want to take care of the library. And there doesn't seem to be any basis anymore to keep it on the city books um, just keep it clean, mm -hmm. and we know that it's going to get, I think the, the library can be confident now it's going to be used by the foundation for basically whatever the library asks for or needs. Right. It is also, thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's also good to note that on the Mead Public Library Foundation Board of Trustees, two of those seats are reserved for trustees of our board to really facilitate that strong communication and support of what they are doing that is truly benefiting the, the Mead Public Library. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, uh, so at this time, uh, I, I think um, 
I am going to propose uh, two different motions, one that is uh, very similar to that was already passed at the Finance Committee, but the secondary motion uh, would be the, uh, another step to, uh, due to the uh, timing of all of this in the summer, that uh, once the legal document is drafted uh, by a, a lawyer uh, for, on behalf of uh, May Public Library, that this board of trustees would authorize myself as president to uh, sign the document and then present that to the foundation of the Mead Public Library, excuse me, the Mead Public Library Foundation. So I'm actually gonna be uh, putting forth two motions, keeping it separate because it, otherwise the motion's like a paragraph. <laughs> and it's a little confusing. And Sydney, don't worry, I'm sending this all to you. So <laughs> you don't need to write this in warp speed to keep up with me. So uh, the first motion that I am looking for is that uh, uh, recommending that uh, our board gift the balance of the Mead account to the foundation and that the funds are approved to engage a lawyer to draw up the paperwork for the ownership transfer of the funds. So would someone like to make? Okay, so it looks like uh, been moved, is there a second? Second. I'll second that, this is Meg. Okay, thank you, Meg. All right, any further discussion about that particular motion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Um, the secondary uh, motion that I already sort of described, would someone like to make a motion uh, to um, authorize the uh, Mead Public Library Board President to sign the uh, transfer of, um, excuse me, I wrote it down and then I'm not even following my own directions. So sorry about that. I think it's the mask and everything. I can't see. So I'm going to try it again. Um, so at this time, I'm looking for a motion to um, authorize the Mead Public Library Board President to uh, sign the document um, drawn up by the lawyer for the ownership transfer of funds to the foundation. I also move. Okay. Mary Lynn, second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're moving on to 3.3, uh, update of gift policy. So this one is uh, just sort of a follow-up to the last agenda item, but we did create a gift policy in 2014 that hasn't been updated since. And uh, again, we sort of compromised at that point in time um, and had one, anything over $100 in donations would go to the foundation and anything under we just kept um, at the library. And what we're proposing is just to, again, as Mary Lynn said, to clean things up, just to have one process where everything goes to the foundation as a gift. And so we did strike through the language other, uh, towards the bottom of that page. Are there any questions or comments regarding the changes to the gift policy? Does Mary Lynn, I move approval. Okay. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Uh, next up, 3.4, update to uh, table of organization. And uh, would, would you like to speak to that point, uh, Kathy Norman, and I have to make sure her thing is on, okay? Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to the background and then I'm gonna let Garrett get into the mm -hmm. nitty gritty of it. Um, but we, uh, we're looking at some of the positions that um, things like the, the maintenance people that are doing cleaning um, and thought that some of them were sort of in the wrong spot and should possibly report directly to Garrett. When Garrett first came on, he tried to keep his 
a direct report says streamlined as possible because he was new and going up the learning curve and he now feels that he can take on some more of the administrative um, duties and get some people some more uh, stability to have them be in places that uh, make more sense. So for instance, we have an IT guy who often needs to be dealing directly with the communications guy and it makes more sense for them to be together um, rather than have the IT person up through maybe like the uh, uh, library services department. So we did a little bit of shifting around. Um, so it's essentially it's like three, three additional employees will be reporting up directly through Garrett. Um, so, Garrett, would you like to describe exactly how that TO change will work? So, so actually, we have two, and during the discussion, we had two scenarios, and we've got uh, two different documents placed up there for you to pick which one is uh, you prefer. One is, it's actually, there's uh, three FTEs, but it's actually four people because the cleaners are, are half-time. And so there's actually uh, four in the maintenance group and then uh, the one IT person. So it's a total of five people. Um, five heads, so to speak. So um, one of the scenarios is to have those five uh, direct, report directly to me. And then the other document uh, has a revision that was discussed um, at the meeting, which has um, us recreating a maintenance supervisor position, which we did have um, uh, until a couple years ago when we had a retirement. Um, and then uh, also the IT person would still be under me. So it would be a total in that second um, scenario of just having two people under me and then under the maintenance supervisor you would have the three people so I wouldn't have as many direct reports. So that was another option discussed that's there. So um, that's a cost of about $5,200 um, per year. So those are the two scenarios to discuss, I guess. Any uh, questions or comments? Okay, so didn't we come out, we, we had the different scenarios, but didn't we come out with the one as our suggested recommendation? Uh, we did, we did all, yeah, we did, um, at that time we didn't have the supervisor as an option. It was, I thought, uh, brought to my attention to um, also bring that as a scenario. We okay. had to come up with costs that I didn't have at the time though. Okay, all right, so, so do we wanna have an open discussion about mm -hmm. which scenario makes more sense? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And this is uh, Maeve speaking, and, and uh, at that meeting, you know, just looking at the table of organization and trying to figure out, you know, what makes good sense, what's, what's, uh, what is the most efficient use of everyone's time. And, you know, I, I remember from, you know, a few years ago that we actually had someone that was more at the level of maintenance supervisor with, you know, cleaners and, uh, you know, other staff underneath monitoring. And, and looking at um, our table of organization when we were at the meeting, I sort of said it would be interesting to explore whether or not that's even feasible or possible. Uh, not knowing, um, you know, uh, the individuals and whether or not there seems to be a good match for that, partic for that particular uh, table of organization. So, so we have two options, revision one, in which we would have one, two, three, uh, trying to count. Three, four, six. we would have seven full. Well, it's five people that would. Uh, basically five people under the library director versus having just four, is that? Versus two. So two. Um, and so um, uh, in, in talking with, with Garrett, I suggested that if he could provide us with those two options that he would bring it forward so that we'd have a chance to t talk about it at this meeting. So, yeah, I'd be curious if anybody okay. has any suggestions or recommendations. I mean, we were kind of flying blind a little bit at the meeting and not having the numbers and how mm -hmm. it would play out, but we just knew it made sense to move some people over. Right. Um, so I think whatever would work better, you know, what makes more sense. Do you think both of them would work, Garrett? I mean, it's, it would be easier on me to do uh, the option of having the supervisor again, so I'm not um, chasing cleaners around, mm -hmm. you know, and that sort of a thing, but uh, it is $5,200, so that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone was raising their hand on the screen. I think it was Mary Lynn. Uh, go ahead, Mary Lynn. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would just say whatever Garrett feels is uh, mm -hmm. most efficient and helpful to him. I mean, I, I don't really feel like I'm in a position to, to say yay or 
knee without Garrett telling us what he wants. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would prefer the maintenance supervisor. We did have it, and it worked pretty well in the past. And, and this is Maeve speaking, and I, as what it was discussed uh, even at our HR meeting, is that the, the importance of keeping our facility clean has had all sorts of new safety uh, realizations, I think, for all of, we've all known that, but I think with this latest pandemic, it has really brought to the forefront how critical it is to have key places, key people in positions overseeing the fact that we are trying to keep our building uh, very safe for our employees as well as the public. And, uh, and I would think I would, uh, I, I'm at the point where I would like to support a structure that uh, our library director thinks would be best for our library. Any other, uh, Kyle, Welton. Uh, I would move that we approve the maintenance supervisor option. And another comment I'll just add is that Garrett's time is incredibly valuable. And so I think it's a $100 investment in having a supervisor so that um, he's got you know, fewer direct reports and can spend his time elsewhere is, is worth, worth that, that amount. Is there someone who would like to make a second? I'll second. Uh, Kathy I'm Norman. Well, lots of people second, mm -hmm. but I think Kathy Norman was first in person. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Any uh, further discussion? Uh, May Cheryl uh, Nesman had her hand up, and I don't know if she doesn't have her hand up anymore. But I thought I would, <laughs> Cheryl, if you. I was just going to add that um, so maintenance has been under me and I agree that um, having the supervisor model would probably work the best, um, not only for Garrett, but just for the maintenance team as well as, as far as being able to get their work done efficiently. Um, and I have complete faith in, uh, in the person who would be going into that supervisor position. Um, and I just wanted to let the board know that I've been talking with him as well and and we've agreed that it would be also beneficial just for him to um, continue to bounce ideas off of Melissa and I whenever there is um, a change to be made in one of the public areas. Yeah. Cheryl, I agree 100%. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Very helpful uh, additions. Thank you, uh, Cheryl. That's, it's good to have that uh, perspective that you have. Uh, shared with all of us. Is there anyone else? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. So at this time, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on now to 3.5, discussion of marketing strategies. And may I just say that I'm so sad that Dirk Zeilman is still not on the board because when we ever had the word marketing on our agenda, he was the happiest person in the room. So I'm hoping he's watching on TV uh, that, that we have not given up on that critical part of getting our message out to the community. So I will turn this over to Garrett. So this may be our most interesting discussion of the day. Um, so... Lots has happened in the, in the world um, in the last few weeks even. And so we started having a discussion about um, our social media strategies and really um, we, we were kind of at, uh, at odds to, to some extent within the staff ourselves. And so we thought we better uh, bring this to the attention of the board and kind of have you guys give us some direction. But ultimately, um, as we looked into this, you know, we spent a few uh, two years ago, we spent quite a bit of time on the marketing committee working on a strategic plan for marketing and as well as Josh wrote up a plan, a subsequent plan for us to uh, tell me basically how he was going to um, try and to get the strategic initiatives done. But what, what I realized in this last couple weeks is that we don't really have good policy to back that up. We don't have um, for instance, an updated social media policy or a public relations or, or more of a broader media type policy. And so Josh, hopefully he's on, on this, uh, listening to the conversation because um, we were going to charge him with having to try to write this. Um, but what happened really was that um, with the death of George Floyd and all of the subsequent protests across the world, 
um, it made us realize that we really didn't, we weren't really sure of what, how we should respond to certain incidents is really what it comes down to. Um, in the past, we chose only to market um, library events and inform the community of different things in various ways. We did not take stands on issues and, and get involved that way. Um, that being said, um, our strategic plan really states that we are to provi provide leadership in the community and act as a catalyst for change. And so the, the two are a little bit at, at odds. Um, when George Floyd died, um, at first we, as a staff, decided to put together a list of resources pertaining to racism. Um, but a few days later, Melissa came to me representing um, several staff in saying we needed to take a stronger response. Several libraries had taken very strong responses and said we're behind Black Lives Matter against police brutality and those sorts of things. Um, and other libraries had not taken a stand at all. And so we kind of went back and forth among Josh and I and trying to understand uh, what we should be putting down as an organization. Um, we were, I mean, I, I had a problem personally. I, I didn't want to be accusatory towards police because, I mean, I have a good relationship with our, our police chief as well as our police here in town. Um, and so it was, it was hard to, for me to go further than what libraries traditionally had. However, staff had a really good point in that our strategic plan says we are to be leaders in the community and catalysts. And so, um, let me see, here's my next point. Um, so basically, I guess that, that's sort of the, 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 the problem that we had was we don't have a statement or any policy telling us what we should be doing um, moving forward. So I'm, I had a whole two or three pages that I had written down, but I think you kind of get the gist of it. Um, and in fact, it's interesting as well to read the ALA, the American Library Association. They have written a statement on that incident as well. However, in, in their statement, in their code of ethics, which we do have um, attached in one of the links, um, in, in number six, they talk about, uh, let's see if I can find it quick. It, it's essentially about um, not having personal biases um, in, in, the, in the workplace. And so I guess I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. She has a bunch of uh, uh, in, uh, articles that she had added to the agenda as well, and hopefully you all get a chance to read it, but even the library world itself is not quite sure how to deal with it. So it kind of becomes a local issue on how you want us to uh, react to certain situations and whether we should be making statements or not making statements to try to remain neutral, and that's sort of the gist of, of our confusion. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa. Um, who thinks we should be making more stronger statements, I believe. So, Melissa, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, sorry I, you can't see me. I had to share my webcam with another staff member. So um, I won't really say a lot. I think that the resources I shared sort of speak for themselves, and I'd like really to hear what um, you all think about it. But um, as Garrett kind of alluded to, I think uh, he and I have a philosophical disagreement on this issue. Um, my interpretation of the professional ethics framework is that um, as a library, we strive to provide accurate information from diverse points of view, um, but that neutrality doesn't mean um, that we don't take a stand on important issues. And in fact, um, the practicing neutrality, that, that concept in that way, um, assumes a false equivalency of viewpoints. And then, of course, um, you know, um, we're not engaging with, with a whole segment of our community. Um, so when libraries choose not to address issues of relevance to people of color, we are not embodying neutrality. Um, in fact, we are ignoring the um, needs of that service population. So that's my personal view on it. And with that, I'll turn it over to you all for discussion. Uh, this is uh, Maeve and, uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you both for, for you know, uh, sharing your perspective and bringing this to light. This is a perfect example of why I absolutely love mm -hmm. Mead Public Library because we're all about really trying to learn and educate and, and try to uh, sort of elevate uh, 
uh, you know, our community. And so uh, it's almost like we are, we are a perfect example of what uh, is happening and should be happening, you know, all over our country. Um, I can just share that from the uh, items that were shared under 3.5 discussion of marketing strategies, uh, the information that was shared from the American Libraries Association and organization, there is so many um, helpful, detailed, uh, wonderful um, statements and resources. So um, it took a bit of time personally to kind of uh, work through all of that. And you know, at the end of the discussion that we of the board uh, have today, is it your um, hope, um, Garrett and Melissa, that the board uh, has some guidelines for you or some policies? Because it seemed as though that is the piece that was missing that didn't provide real good direction for Mead during this particular point in time. Is that my understanding? Yeah, the, the main goal of today is really to hear from all of you and then for us to uh, write a policy that we could bring back to the board and see if, if we got it right, so to speak, and, and what you want, how you want us to react to situations. Obviously, this will not be the last um, situation like this. This will come up again, and you know we do have. Uh, I guess I see it as sort of a conflict in library world about neutrality versus in in particular issues versus um, getting involved and being leaders. Okay. So uh, thank you. So at this time, I think I'm just going to turn it over to whichever trustee who would like to uh, talk first or perhaps pose a question. So just seeing if anyone has some thoughts. So I'm going to call on Mary Lynn Donahue. Um, and I really respect uh, Garrett's viewpoint, um, but I just want to tell you that I've been personally disappointed that the city of Shibosan, um has not taken a more definitive stand on social justice issues. I know the mayor did present a proclamation to um, a black leader in the community, and that was wonderful, and that he led a conversation um, with the police chief a couple of Saturdays ago. But if you look at the city's website, there's not much going on. Uh, there's not any articulation of um, where we are. And the city, the school district, I mean, we are the institutions the institutional framework for how people uh, interact uh, in more official kinds of ways. And um, I think bringing the library into, into sharper relief in terms of how it expresses itself would be something that I would be personally supportive of. Just saying. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Kathy Norman? Yeah, I would be in, um, completely in favor of um, having some sort of definitive statement about our commitment to social justice and, and race equality and everything else. And I don't think it has to, I, I think there's a way to do that without it being like a direct slam at the police. I mean, I think there is a middle ground where we're sticking up for what we believe in and proclaiming what libraries are all about and not necessarily offending people. Now, we may offend. I don't know, hardcore conservatives that don't even like any statements like that. But in the end, does it really matter? Because that's not what the library is about. So we might as well be real as to what we're about and what our mission is. And if that means being forth, forth right about you know serving everybody and um, caring about justice and you know uh, uh, just minorities that are discriminated against, then I, I think that's totally consistent with what we're doing. Uh, this is Maeve. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that um, I've always been so uh, pleased with with our library is that every time I would go in, there would be a you know area right on the first floor covering some kind of topic or something that I was completely unaware of. <laughs> so there's nothing like walking into your library and realizing that you still have to learn. Um, uh, uh, you know, every time you go in there. And, uh, you know, it's almost like 
maybe it was a year ago, or Melissa corrected, maybe it was two years ago, but I remember walking in and there were these massive, like eight foot by four foot huge uh, posters uh, that really was going into the in-depth history of the redlining that was done in Milwaukee and how the city really through its policies really you know, made uh, certain areas of Milwaukee uh, only uh, for, for a particular you know, group of people. And that was by design. Um, and, you know, and that was in Sheboygan, <laughs> you know, teaching us something that maybe many of us weren't aware of. Um, so you know, when we put together our, um, our sort of mission in talking about how we view the library and its importance to its community, the catalyst for change is the piece that I keep coming back to. Um, and I agree with Kathy, I think there are ways that we're, we're able to do that by just providing people with information that they didn't even realize they needed. You know, so a lot of it is just, you know, by not saying anything, it's almost as if we're stating that the way things are currently, they're fine, but by really trying to encourage people to learn more or be aware of things that are not fair and what your role is in trying to make it better and more equitable for everyone, I think it's pretty powerful. I, I was so pleased with some of the Facebook posts that the library has been doing about uh, sharing resources that we have in our library so people can learn more about racism, they can learn more about the history of why uh, people are feeling that our country is not treating them equally. Uh, uh, I, you know, I just, I thought those um, Facebook posts were really quite powerful and, and I'm just wondering, you know, what, there must be some other ways or some other suggestions to, to bring that knowledge further. Um, Marcos Guevara. Hi, everybody. Um, I, what, what I want to say um, is, is grounded in civil, civil liberties and, and civil rights, right? Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people uh, watching this on this, on this conference and, and on this call uh, know this, but I, I think it's important sometimes to review. Um, civil liberties are the spaces and places we don't want the government to, to be in, right? Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of religion, uh, free press, uh, we, we, that's, that's where government shouldn't be. Those are spaces where, where government should be. Uh, and civil rights is where we're asking the government to ensure justice and equity. Uh, as an instance of government, uh, we have a responsibility to use our, our, the resources and tools at our uh, disposal um, to, to, to fight for justice, to fight for, for, for equality. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, uh, I want to encourage us, uh, to keep, keep in mind that, uh, a lot, a lot of outcomes in, in our society are unfairly, um, predictable based on things that, uh, shouldn't predict an outcome, uh, race, uh, gender identity, uh, sexual, uh, preference, um, country of origin, citizenship status, all, all kinds of things, uh, the, the, the belonging to a Native American tribe, um, so much so that, that there are laws uh, naming these, uh, these identities, these people, these, uh, these communities as, as special protected classes. So I think it's incumbent on instances of government like the library uh, to uh, not only um, Provide uh, knowledge and 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 lead, but also to ensure equity and justice for those the, those protected classes, uh, especially. Uh, so I, I personally would have loved to have seen the library take a stronger stance and 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 to loudly pro proclaim in in all its ways that Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kyle Welton. Hey, uh, I 
I want to echo a lot of the sentiments I've heard from my colleagues. Uh, I would agree. I, I also would like to see the library take a stronger stance. And I, I understand that there is um, some unique considerations when we can consider the library as an institution. Um, that being said, I do think on matters such as this, it's, it's critical that in our role um, of public trust, right, that we um, take a stance forward that advocates on behalf of equity and fairness um, for all citizens. Um, and that leads to controversy, perhaps, but I think it's um, necessary and long overdue if, if, if it draws controversy. Um, the, the thing I, I would also like to add is um, I think institutions like the, the library are critical when we think about the role of um, creating anti-racist structures and policies, right? As we, as we look at the world around us, the library can facilitate the understanding and, and meaning and um, education that's required for the public to understand really the root cause of these injustices that we see around us on a daily basis. Um, you know, behavior is the, the result of individuals, but um, there are a lot of different forces and structures put in place that incentivize different behaviors and guide people toward those actions. And when you look at large disparate outcomes across populations that really have no good, good reason for why they are disparate, um, the, it comes back to what's the policy structure in place that's creating racial disparity. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's critical that we promote anti-racism, um, not just simply taking the stance of, of not racist in, in complicity, right, um, but actively advocating toward that educated stance. Um, we've got a long way to go, and we can be a leader in, in, in creating that change. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Uh, anyone else? Oh, uh, Meg Albrink. Um, I want to echo what um, my colleagues are sharing here. I think, you know, as one of the values of the Mead Public Library, inclusion is an action. It's not just an, I, it's not just a thought, it's actually an action. And so I think as we strive for inclusiveness as an organization, I think it is incumbent on us to act our inclusiveness, to make statements about our commitment to it, in addition to our um, policies and procedures. So I think some of the things that we did today in terms of the fine policy is a great action that accompanies a, po a, a value of inclusiveness. And I think statements um, like those uh, that we're hearing are important as well. So to, to actively in, in state that Black Lives Matter is part of that inclusive policy. Any other um, comment or question? Uh, I did manage to um, call up the uh, statement that Mead Public Library shared on Facebook on June 9th. Uh, I think this was probably several days after um, there was some posts about uh, various uh, resources um, in, in regards to books or movies, but um, in echoing what Meg has shared and what others have shared, you know, focusing on what our values are and how this connects to this uh, time and place in our history. But I'm just going to read just a couple of the uh, statements f just so that um, for those of you who may have not seen it on Facebook, because, you know, things go so quickly and June 9th already feels like 60 days ago. <laughs> but, uh, but on June 9th, our library shared this. And, and uh, from my perspective, I feel like the library has been uh, probably one of the leaders in the community in putting forth statements prior to even our city government or the police station or the fire department or the parks department or all the others. But this is what was on uh, Facebook. It states, inclusiveness is one of our core values and we strive every day to offer a safe and welcoming space for people of all backgrounds to relax, socialize, and pursue personal enrichment. That's why we stand in solidarity with our fellow community members in speaking out against racism and oppression and in grieving the senseless killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others. We encourage our fellow community members to check out our recommended reading and viewing list compiled in our staff blog 
blog that gives the information. To learn more about race and social justice, we also recommend exploring the growing number of events being held in our community right now on this topic. And then it connected to um, a Sheboygan Press article with a couple of uh, events. Uh, so that is something that our library had um, already done. Um, so I have something to say, Maeve, if I could. Sure. <clears throat> this is Sydney. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, oh. just, just playing devil's advocate a tiny little bit, um, I 100% agree with all of the things that have been said, um, and I firmly believe that Black Lives Matter. What I want to remind everyone of is that several months back, we had a bulletin board policy change regarding a very specific um, organization that wanted to advertise in the library. And I guess um, my question would be for the board members, whether this is, um, I guess whether we really think that supporting one area and not supporting another area is to our benefit, um, especially given that we are supposed to be neutral and we have already um, censored certain information from the public. Um, just, it's just a thought that I wanted to throw that out there. Okay. Any other question or comments? Um, Kyle Welton. Oh. I, I do remember that real quick. Uh, what was the what was the poster that prompted the, the policy? I'm trying to remember. I don't. And I'm not able to dig back in my email. Kyle, this is Garrett. It was an abortion uh, rights or uh, anti-abortion type group, is what it was. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I. I uh, I guess what my, my thoughts in, in regards to that, um, there are, there are, there are certain issues I think where we can kind of understandably just trying to find the right way to word this. Um, it, obviously all of these things are tricky. Um, I think that, um, the library getting involved in terms of uh, the, the debate over abortion rights, um, in my opinion, feels different. And I, I guess this is on the fly, so I apologize using the word feel because I'd like to come back to, to more perhaps reason structured arguments, but it uh, seems different to me than talking about issues of, of systemic racism um, and uh, the how that plays out in terms of the, the murder of innocence, right? Um, and so uh, I do I do appreciate that, Sydney, because we have to make sure that we're consistent with how we apply um, our mission and our, our values and, and what our role is in what our controversial topics, um, whether we believe that it's not controversial or not. Okay. I'm uh, calling on Kathy Norman next. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try to play off of what Kyle was starting to articulate. I do see these things as different because um, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life really shouldn't, it, it is a controversial topic that doesn't necessarily belong in the library. But when you're talking about social justice and equality, it does because it's part of our mission and it's part of what the library is about. So I actually... I, I recognize that it seems a little two-faced, Sydney, and I appreciated your devil's advocate, um, you know, raising that that we're trying to be neutral. But this one actually seems this issue seems uh, to be reflective of what we're about as a library, and so I think it's appropriate to um, take a stronger vocal position. Okay, uh, turning this over to Nancy Manchin. I think a uh, key word that. Kyle used here is the word debate and the issue of uh, rights on abortion is a debatable issue on social justice. There's, there is no debate uh, 
on something mm -hmm. like that. And, and that, to me, um, helps us, helps to guide us toward mm -hmm. what we would do um, to fulfill our mission. Thank you, Nancy. Um, any other questions or comments? So in, in hearing all of my uh, trustees, it seems as though um, they are in uh, support of our library, uh, really trying to be a leader on uh, the, the core issues of our democracy, which involves you know, equality and justice. And so uh, I think, Garrett, we've sort of provided you with some um, direction and how that manifests itself into a policy. Uh, we encourage you and Melissa and Cheryl to really uh, <laughs> uh, uh, dig in and, and, and determine how best uh, you think uh, a policy can provide guidance because I, I think as we go forward as a community, uh, the issues of trying to highlight equality and social justice for all in our community is going to be a continued conversation. And so the policy that's put forward, I think, will be probably the most referenced policy in the next mm -hmm. couple years. So uh, I really appreciate you uh, bringing this forward uh, to have this conversation, uh, because I think in so many cases, um, uh, challenging topics are uh, just kind of shelved or uh, sort of put to the side because uh, they require a lot of thought and uh, careful direction. So um, I welcome seeing this policy. Do you think we'll see it in July or what's your hope? <laughs> um, we will try to put something together for next month. Yes, yeah, so I appreciate the feedback and uh, Josh is a super talented writer and we'll, we'll do our best to put something out there and, and get feedback at the next meeting. Okay. Any other uh, questions or thoughts? All right. Um, I do think Dirk Zeilman really would have loved this conversation, <laughs> so I, I might send him a you know a <laughs> written <laughs> summary of it. Uh, moving on then to the director's report, four point one update on services and programming. And so I'll again delegate to uh, Melissa for four point one and Cheryl for four point two. Okay, just a few updates on programs and services. Um, we're pretty much status quo with our hours um, and building setup at this point. It's working well for our staff and patrons. Um, feedback has been mostly positive. Uh, the main negative really has been the uh, children's library being closed still. So we are um, exploring some options for opening that up a bit. Um, we've started by putting quite a bit of uh, children's material down on the first floor <laughs> now, and we are doing the book bundles as well. So um, if anyone who's interested um, in just getting a random selection of books based on their child's reading needs, uh, they can call us and we'll put that together for them. And then looking at programs, we've seen some of our um, online program attendance taper off a bit, which is not surprising uh, given that the weather's nice and people have had enough of being cooped up in front of video screens. Uh, so we are looking at some um, kind of passive programming outside of the building. So we are working with the bid to um, develop a story walk uh, which will be downtown um, along 8th Street. Um, and what it is is it's um, kind of enlarged pages from a children's book and you walk to each page to read the book. Oh, so no. um, we're also working on some activity kits for kids that we will send out with the summer library program sign up. Um, it includes a variety of things that kids can do at home. There'll be some um, making type of stuff in there as well, make your own bubbles um, and other STEM type of things. And then we also have launched Dial a Story. So if you want to call the library and get a bedtime story, you can do that. <laughs> uh, it is extension 2072. <laughs> and we're using stories that are in the public domain. Um, so definitely check that out. 
Um, we're excited about that. We're, we're hoping to get um, both children's and adult content on there um, for you to, to hear a nice story. And then we are also looking at um, opening our makerspace up a little bit by appointment um, so that folks can get in there to use the equipment and we can still uh, maintain uh, safe distance and all of that. So that will be coming probably in July. And um, our makerspace coordinator, Ann Miller, has also uh, started working with the Sheboygan County mask makers yeah. um, who have been providing the cloth masks for the library uh, to distribute to patrons. Um, but we are going to work with them to um, provide them with access to our sewing machines and our AccuQuilt, which um, can cut um, mask fabric six at a time. So that should be really helpful to them. And then of course, continuing to print the ear savers on our 3D printer. Um, and that's all the updates I have. Well, I didn't expect such a robust uh, report on programming during the, 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 this COVID pandemic that we're going through. So thank you, Melissa. I do have to ask one trivia question, and it may not be there anymore, but when I was at the library a week ago, there were printed out uh, photos of, I think, birds or something at the bottom of the um, uh, front doors, like all the front doors had animals printed at the bottom. And I didn't know if that was some kind of fun children's game that, that I was unaware of. I'll let Cheryl answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe it's I'll not something I want to share. <laughs> I'll include that in my building updates. Um, <laughs> if, if it's okay to move on to that. Uh, well, uh, I'll just check to see if anyone else, okay, we'll find out from Cheryl why there are those pictures. Now I'm really intrigued. Um, <laughs> are there any other questions or comments from Melissa on services or programming? Oh, uh, Marcos. Um, yeah, Melissa, I was, I was wondering um, how uh, our patrons uh, complying with uh, the request to wear uh, face coverings when they're when they're uh, using library services that's a great question it's been mixed um, and honestly it seems to vary from day to day and the first week that we opened we probably saw 70 to 80 percent of people wearing masks when they came in mm -hmm. and that has tapered off quite a bit um, it is starting to cause some concern for our staff I think um, so I know we've, I don't know if this is open for discussion right now, but we have talked about the possibility of requiring patrons to wear masks, especially because we are providing them at no cost um, in our work with the mask makers group. So um, it, it really, it varies quite a bit from day to day. Okay. This, is, uh, this is particularly concerning to me because the effects of COVID have been so racialized. Um, and 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 marginalized and and um, immunocompromised people are are the ones that are really affected, um, and and so rooted in the no shoes, no shirts, no service. Uh, I I think uh, I could easily support uh, a no mask, no service uh, policy as well. Okay, um, I'm just. Turning, uh, I'm looking at uh, Garrett Erickson. As far as the city at this point, I mean, I know that they have a requirement, I think, within their buildings for staff to wear masks at this time. If you could just so, elaborate. Sure. So staff do have to wear masks if they're um, in common areas. If they're in an office, they don't have to. Um, or if they're in a car by themselves, they don't have to. But otherwise, or outside, I should t say as well. Otherwise, staff are required to wear a mask at this point. Um, we did send a, or I did send something to Chuck Adams, our city attorney, about it. Um, the library board does have the power to uh, create like an institution, a department policy for the public. Um, however, the enforcement of it would be on staff. It's not a law, so the police don't enforce company policy is my understanding of it. And that would be the hard part, it would be the enforcement angle. The staff would have to take care of that. So um, it is something we're talking about. 
Um, in light of uh, the initial uh, opening, we had a 70% of people wearing masks, and now that that's summer and people are feeling as though maybe it's not as dangerous as, as a virus, and that's just not happening here, it's happening you know, throughout the <laughs> United States, um, I think it would be of great benefit for our um, library if we can have this topic uh, be on our agenda for next month and that we as a board can have a full discussion on um, what steps we would like to take. And I guess the more follow-up piece is because I know so many people are not able to afford masks. Um, if we were to take the step of requiring uh, what financial assistance um, would we have from the city or from the state or federal with COVID uh, protective gear, um, you know, just so that we have an awareness of uh, what that also means for our, our budget costs. And I'm turning it right back over to Garrett. <laughs> I just do have one comment on that. We are starting to run into problems getting uh, PPE in certain areas. And so if we open that up completely, uh, we may struggle to provide that. Okay. So. All right. But, uh, but I, th I, I think this would, would be a very good uh, topic for us to be a little more educated about and have a fuller discussion uh, next month and then perhaps uh, decide on whether or not we want to uh, add that requirement to our public as they enter our buildings. So Kyle, thank you. Kyle, what? Oh. Kyle. oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Kyle Weldon. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so we're talking through uh, masks in the school districts as well. Um, I've been approached, and I know that Seth has been approached as well. There's a, a group of um, some retired women in town that are just amazing who have uh, sewing cloth masks for many organizations. And they did tell us that, you know, if we give uh, them enough heads up, they could produce enough for all the students in the school district. Um, and that would be a, you know, a donation. Um, so is it, I wonder if we could research if we would be allowed to accept a donation and allow the use of hand homemade cloth masks that you know, would be provided to the public as a cost neutral solution to the library. I do know that uh, when we first opened, the cloth masks that were donated were absolutely beautiful and people were so pleased that the library was offering that option uh, of the, the cloth mask. So. All right, any other uh, questions or comments on the, under services and programming? Otherwise, we get to turn on, uh, go on to 4.2 update on building projects where my trivia <laughs> question earlier <laughs> might be answered by Cheryl, but now I'm not too sure I want the answer, <laughs> but um, I will turn this over to Garrett and then he it's, can. Yes, yeah, Cheryl could uh, speak on this particular item. Sure, so um, along the bottom of our main entrance doors and windows, we have alternating pictures of a, a cat <laughs> and an owl, and I think we might have a, um, a hawk outline thrown in there too. Uh, a few weeks ago, not well, about three weeks ago, we had a crazy uh, seagull who, <laughs> who was, I, I, we imagined seeing his own reflection in, in the glass and was harming himself trying to get to his reflection, <laughs> we'll just say. Um, so, and, and there was quite a bit of, of a mess around on the ground around it. Uh, so we, we decided to try that and he went away. So we are planning on taking those down really soon and hoping <laughs> that Mr. Siegel or Mrs. Siegel stays away, but we'll, we'll let you know. Well, you'll know if the, the pictures go back up, but they have worked. <laughs> I, I think I like my description better that it was a fun kids game, but, but, but thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> very sure. clever, you very clever. Go ahead and continue to think that on you, <laughs> it's fine. Um, so the other updates. So we have contractors uh, that are putting the doors on our materials return room today. Uh, that is almost the last step. Uh, we will still have to have them out to do some painting and then the hardware is gonna go on the doors. So my guess is that um, it'll probably be another week before it's completely done. I have started to think though about how we're going to include that in our 
our workflows in the, the returns room. Uh, so we should be ready to go. Um, and maybe we'll want to do a tour with this group if you all want to see how that, that works once we have everything in place. Um, the contractor who planted trees and seeded the lawn last year has been out to do some touch-up work. Uh, they will be returning again, though. There's still a little bit more that needs to be done. We have some leveling off near some of the, the uh, sidewalks that needs to be done, as well as reseeding. And they are keeping an eye on a few of the trees that they planted that have not weathered the winter very well. Um, some will be replaced. Others, they see a little bit of green on them, so they're hoping that they pull through. Uh, we also had somebody out this week to um, to fix the piping on our our cooling towers. When it was installed not too long ago, um, there was a problem with how they insta installed the piping between the the towers, which made it really difficult for the maintenance crew to maintain a, a level in both of those coolers. Uh, so we had somebody come out, redo that. It should be working a lot better. If you're in the library Friday morning, you might notice that it's a little bit hot because we need to turn the air conditioner off to do that work. Um, we are hoping to have somebody out on Monday or Tuesday of next week, weather permitting, to look at some of the areas um, on the, the bottom edge of the roofing. I mentioned this, I think, at our last meeting. We have a couple of leaks when we have those really strong storms where the, the rain is coming in horizontally. Uh, so we're having the, the contractor come out to do some repairs to that, to, to uh, fix those leaks. And he is also going to take a look at our tuck pointing at that time just to see what it looks like, what condition all of that is in. I know we had discussed uh, maybe working that into a, a, a plan down the road to have that done. Um, we are looking at how we're gonna handle voting in the, it, in the August and November elections. Mm -hmm. That usually occurs in the ROCA room. We're currently using the ROCA room for quarantining our return materials. So we are, Thinking of some options here, Melissa is reaching out to the clerk to find out uh, what their suggestions are, see if there are any restrictions as far as what we can do. Uh, so there will be more on that, but that is it, it, at the for, forefront of our thoughts right now because that's going to come up awfully quickly. Uh, we are also getting a quote on a gate, which we want to put across the Northwest Emergency Exit. Um, it's kind of by the book returns area, and uh, it, it that exit, there's a brick wall coming off of it, and we have found that it provides quite a blind spot where there has been some possibly uh, dangerous behavior happening behind that wall. Uh, so we're, we're getting a quote on a gate that can go across that. Uh, it's also in the back corner where our bug room, sorry, our materials <laughs> return room is going to go. Um, so we want to make sure that if we do get a gate that it will allow for anyone who is back in that area to escape without having to unlock something. Um, but it will require lock for um, anyone trying to enter the building at that point. I think that's it. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Does anyone have any questions or comments? All right, thank you. Uh, moving on then to 4.3, the monthly statistics. Um, just uh, that, of course, these run a month behind. So these are May, and we were closed in most of May, so they're pretty far down. And I'm hopeful that next month when we meet, uh, some of our numbers will start to come back up as we opened up. Okay, any questions or comments? 
I, I, uh, Kathy Norman. Yeah, I do have a question about um, usage. Even though we don't have the statistics yet, are we seeing that there was pent up demand and you know, with us being closed and that there was a sudden surge of people coming in or are people kind of still staying away? I'm, I'm just curious if we're getting Well, I mean, looking at the stats, it looks like we're at about half of last year. I guess I should probably turn this over to Melissa and, and Cheryl more because they deal with uh, returns and, and the materials going out. Did you all want to make comments? Sure, I can jump in first. Um, just our gate count since we've opened has been about half of what it typically is. So um, we're seeing 300 to 500 people come through the doors every day, and we'd usually see double that uh, this time of year. Uh, that bears out too with like our summer library program registration is down by about half. Um, but in terms of, of activity with checking out materials, I feel like that's been going pretty strong, so I'll let Cheryl jump in on that. Sure. Um, you know, just traffic-wise, it looks like we've had a few more slower days, so, you know, a few less people. As far as returns go, um, we were pretty steady, and uh, and our transit between the, the member libraries has been uh, – very robust, I guess you would say. Um, we have had a couple of slower days with returns, especially I think it was last Saturday and possibly uh, this Monday. We're just a little bit slower, so we're seeing a downward trend, which is which is good when we're thinking about opening our book returns because we were a little bit worried about how well we would be able to man those. So it seems like it's going to be at a more manageable level for us. Any other? Questions, comments? Uh, all right, then uh, moving on then to 5.1, Monarch Library System. I'm turning it over to Nancy Manson. This, excuse me, um, the staff at, at the Monarch System has been working in compliance with COVID-9 health re uh, regulations to continue services. The bookmobile is out on the road and mm. deliveries are being uh, made. Um, so they're working hard to um, maintain those uh, those things that that we uh, expect from Monarch. There's also a bookmobile committee working to establish policy and procedures for the bookmobile, for adding stops, for uh, those things that in the past were not um, were not written into policy. But uh, as more people are aware and with COVID-19, there, there's even more demand um, on the bookmobile. Mm. Um, the search for the, uh, a new director continues and that will be uh, going on in the next couple of weeks. Um, the Monarch Board will meet on July 9th and uh, it's uh, hopeful that we'll have a candidate um, to present at that time. Mm. Okay. Great, hey, thank you, Nancy. Anyone have any questions or comments for Nancy? All right, thank you. Uh, moving on now to 5.2, Friends of Mead Public Library. Uh, Sydney, if you would like to share the report. Yes, um, so the Friends did kind of impromptu meet earlier this week. Um, normally they would have met last week, but they decided that they would like to meet. And so we met at Sharon Quicker's home. Um, honestly, most of the business that they conducted uh, were things that had been canceled for future um, events during the year. For example, the night market and um, things like that. So there wasn't a ton to talk about. Um, they did, however, vote to approve a donation um, to the mask making group that had donated masks to the library uh, when we first opened up again mm -hmm. um, in support of them and try and just give a little bit of a kickback um, and um, potentially to get more masks in the future from them as well. So I think that's kind of the extent of what was covered at that. I think mostly they just wanted to visit with one another again. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments for Sydney? 
uh, just pass along our, our gratitude for their support of uh, the mask makers since, uh, as you had mentioned, the uh, masks were quite beautiful and it was uh, anything we can do to support the mask makers as they continue to support the library is wonderful. So thank you. Looks like uh, our next upcoming meeting will be July 23rd. Um, and I am, a, we have it listed as uh, to be determined, but I am assuming that we are making it a 3 p.m. time. Um, if that time seems to create some difficulty, please get in touch with me uh, within this next week, but otherwise we'll plan for three o'clock. And at this time, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? I also move. Is there a second? This is Mag. I'll second. Okay, it's been seconded. Any, <laughs> any, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Op aye. any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you so much, and may you all continue to enjoy this beautiful weather and be safe out in the community. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.